securing web servers. In Windows 2008, Microsoft have made a conscious effort to harden up IIS 7 and make it more secure than ever before. Now even though IIS 7 isn't installed by default on Windows 2008, when you do decide to install it, a default installation is a really minimal one, only serving up basic static content until you manually add other features to your server. So in this video we're going to cover some of the things you can do to make your IIS 7 web servers even more secure. Now firstly, with like a lot of the security features we've looked at in Windows 2008, you can install IIS in a server core version of Windows 2008. Although that's not something we'll be doing in this video, as we'll cover server core builds in other videos later on. A big part of your web security is how you handle authentication. When people access your site and its content, is it going to be anonymous, meaning anyone can view and access your content? Or is it based on some sort of permissions like a website form, Windows authentication, or some other mechanism. Now, even though we've mentioned authentication here, since it is important, it's not something that we'll be covering in this video, since we'll have another video dedicated to that topic. We'll be talking about removing any unused IIS components, since there's no point having things installed on your web server if they aren't being actively used, because every feature of IIS that isn't being used will not only waste system resources and increase the overall attack surface of your server, and both of those things are something we should be actively trying to reduce. By configuring a unique binding as well, this can prevent IIS from listening on all of the IP addresses that are configured on the server. This means that we can also configure IIS to respond only to requests for a specific host name and not a blanket response to anything that attempts to contact port 80. And that's going to prevent attacks that try to iterate through a range of IP addresses, so we're going to see how we can configure this as well. Now in the past, there were security vulnerabilities that allowed attackers to run executable files in the system directories of Windows. Now even though IIS 7 has been designed to protect against these types of attacks, even Microsoft themselves recommend moving your website content to another disk just in case, so we'll see how we can move our IIS root directories elsewhere. Then we'll discuss permissions and find out how we can use NTFS permissions to further secure the content of our website. SSL allows us to encrypt traffic, so we'll see how we can further secure our server by utilizing a secure sockets layer connection. We'll take a look at URL authorization, which lets us allow or deny users from accessing our website, so we're going to see how we can take advantage of that feature. And finally, we'll talk about IPv4 and domain name restrictions, which lets us allow or deny people coming from certain IP addresses and domains from accessing our websites as well. So there's a lot that we need to cover here, and even though IIS 7 on Windows Server 2008 provides the best security ever in a default installation of IIS, as you've seen, there's still many things to consider before you make your website available to the broader internet. So firstly, we're going to take a look at removing any unused IIS components from your web server, since there's no point having other IIS role services installed on your web server, as they can waste system resources and increase the overall attack surface of your server, and if they're not being used anyway, why bother having them there? So we'll go and click on the Server Management Console icon, and then we'll select Roles, and then we'll scroll down here, and on the right side we'll choose Remove Role Services, and here we can see all of the role services that we've installed on this server that are part of the web server role. So to remove any unwanted role services, simply uncheck the box next to each role service that you want to remove, and then click Next, and then Remove. Now the next thing that we want to cover in this video is bindings. So we're going to click on Start, we'll go to Administrative Tools, and then we'll launch the IIS 7 Manager. Now we'll expand our server here, SO3, we'll expand Sites, and then we'll select our website, and since I only have the default website here, I'm going to choose that. And on the right hand side here, under the Actions pane, we'll choose the Bindings hyperlink. Now, in the new window that appears, we can see here that for our default website, we're currently not using any host name to reference this site, and normally for a single site that's fine, from a functionality perspective at least, 
But if you plan on having more than one site listening on port 80, then you'll want to enter in a host name like www.winstructor.com or winstructortraining.com. So if we highlight this entry and then click edit, we can change a few of those things here. So firstly, we're able to change the IP address that this site listens on. And at the moment, the default here is set to all unassigned. And for my server here, since I only have the one network card, it doesn't matter if I manually select the IP address or leave it at all unassigned, since they'll both be using this IP address anyway. But if you have multiple network cards, then by leaving it to all unassigned, IIS will listen on all of those interfaces, which is probably not what you want. Now we can also change the default port from port 80 if you like to something else. And at the bottom here, we can enter in a host name that you'd like to use for this website. And like I mentioned earlier, that can help prevent attacks that try to iterate through a range of IP addresses. Now the next thing we'll talk about is moving our web content to a new location. In past versions of IIS, there were known security vulnerabilities that allowed attackers to run executable files in the system directories of Windows, including executables like command.exe, which is bad news granting the attacker the ability to run applications on your web server. Now, IIS 7 has been designed to protect against these types of attacks, but even so, Microsoft themselves still recommend that you move your content to another disk just to be sure. So on the Right Now Actions pane, we'll click on the Advanced Settings hyperlink. And right here under the Physical Path heading, we can change the location of where our web content is stored. Now, do bear in mind that when you change this location, IIS won't automatically move your content over to the new location. You'll still have to do that manually. So we can click inside this field and either manually type in a new path or click on this Browse icon here and then browse to the location where we'd like to store our content. Okay, now we're going to talk about permissions, since in order to secure the content available on our website, you'll need to ensure that only the appropriate accounts have permission to the content. So let's go and right click on our default website, and at the top we'll choose Edit Permissions. Now here under the Security tab, you're going to see a bunch of default accounts, creator, owner, system, administrators, users, the IIS iUsers group. And by the way, if you do have FTP installed on your IIS server, you'll notice another group here simply called iUser as well as the IIS iUsers group. And these will allow anonymous access to your website and FTP content. Now, these accounts don't have passwords and as such mean that you no longer have to worry about passwords expiring on these accounts. And it also means that you can, of course, set file permissions for these accounts as well. Now the other advantage of these groups is that the SID of the group is the same on all systems that run Windows Server 2008. This means that if you copy files from one server to another using the xcopy command and then add the slash o switch, then all of the permissions will be retained and that's really useful. But what if you don't want anonymous access to your content? Or maybe you will allow anonymous access, but there's certain content that you only want to be accessible by certain people. Well, in that case, we can use the standard Windows Access Control List to lock it down. So we'll click on the Advanced button and then click Edit. And since a lot of the permissions assigned to this folder have been inherited from the parent folders above this one, we can't directly edit them. So we're going to uncheck this box here to include the inheritable permissions. And then we'll click the Copy button and that'll allow us to retain all of the permissions that already have been assigned to this folder. But now, it's also going to allow us to edit and make changes to them. So if we wanted to allow specific groups to access our content and remove anonymous access, we could click on the Add button. And let's locate, say, the Domain Users group. So I'm going to type in Domain and hit Check Names. And we'll select the Domain Users group and click OK and OK again. And now we just need to set what permissions we'd like them to have. So let's add in Traverse Folder Execute File. We'll add in list, read attributes, we'll add in read extended attributes, and down the bottom we'll also allow the read permissions permission, and then we'll click on OK. Now, of course, we could add in and remove any account from the list here as you require, so you can really lock down these permissions by removing all of the unnecessary ones and only leaving in the accounts that you really need to grant access for. Now, 
Another thing you might wish to implement to improve your security is Secure Sockets Layer or SSL. SSL allows you to encrypt the traffic that travels between the client and the web server and when important data is traveling over an untrusted network like the internet, this will help secure it from spoofing and network sniffing. Now SSL is a topic that really deserves its own video and it's something that we will be covering in a lot of detail later on in other videos so we're really not going to do this topic a great deal of justice here within this video now. But I will show you how you can at least set up IIS with a self-signed certificate and in other videos we'll see how we can implement a bunch of certificate servers in our network and IIS will be part of that discussion. So if you want to implement SSL, there's a few ways you can do it though. One of course is using the certificate console and by using web enrollment and automatic enrollment, we could also use the command line, we could script it, or simply use this IIS 7 console. So since we're already here in the console, we'll do that and we'll take a look right here. So up here we'll select our server, server 03, and then we'll scroll down and we'll locate server certificates. So we'll double click on that. And over on the right here in the actions pane, we've got a few options. Now we can import a certificate if we've already exported one from another server. We could create a certificate request from our certificate server if we have one. And we can complete a certificate request as well. We could create a domain certificate and finally a self-signed certificate. Now whilst a self-signed certificate is good for testing and securing communication between the web server and clients, the downside is that it's not been issued from a trusted certification authority. In other words, it's only this server that's verifying that it's this server, not a third party machine that's vouching for this server's authenticity. But that's okay for our lab here. It's fine for me to utilize a self-signed certificate and the bonus is that it's free to create and we don't need any other machines to create it. So we'll click on create self-signed certificate and we'll need to specify a name for this certificate. So I'm just gonna call this test and then we'll click on okay. All right, well there's our certificate which been issued to this machine and if we scroll across, we can see it's been issued by this machine. And if we scroll across a bit further, we can see when it's due to expire and the certificate hash. So now that we have a certificate, we're able to configure our website to use it. So we'll select our default website again and in the actions pane, we'll choose the bindings link and then we'll click on add. So from our first drop down box here, we're now able to select this and we can choose HTTPS as that was unable before since we didn't have a certificate. So we'll select that and this will change our port here from the default of port 80 to port 443, which is the default SSL port. And the final thing we'll need to do is to select our test certificate from the drop down box here. Now we can also view the details of the certificate if we like. And if you're new to certificate services, I'd recommend that you have a look in here. All right, now we'll click on OK. And we can see that we now have two bindings for our website, one for regular HTTP on port 80, and the second using SSL on port 443. So if we now go and open up Internet Explorer, and we'll navigate to our web server, which is this server, so3.winstructorlab.com, and we'll hit enter. You'll see we'll get back the default page for our default website, and this, of course, is using regular old HTTP using port 80. But if we go and change our HTTP to HTTPS and hit enter, Internet Explorer tells us that we're about to switch to a secure connection, the page loads, and at the top, you can see in the address bar that we have this little padlock icon. If we click this, it tells us a little bit more information about this connection. Now, the next feature of IIS I want to cover is URL authorization, which we can use to grant or deny access to users based on the URL they want to access. So we'll select our default website here and we'll scroll down a bit and we'll double click on authorization rules. And currently we do have one default rule and that's to allow all users access to our site. But in the actions pane, we can create new rules, either allow or deny rules. 
Now, it doesn't really matter which one I select here since the window that pops up is identical. The only difference between the two is that one's for allowing people to access your site and the other's for preventing people from accessing your site. So let's just click on Deny Rule. And this, of course, will allow us to deny access to either all users, so nobody can access the site, which is certainly secure, but it's not very effective since there's no point having one if nobody can access it. We could also deny anonymous users from accessing the site. We could deny specific roles or users. For example, we could deny members of the sales group or the marketing group access. Now we could also specify individual users, so we could prevent Bob from accessing this website. And finally, we can apply our deny rule here to only specific HTTP verbs such as get, post, put, delete, connect, and so forth. Now, the final thing that we need to cover in this video is IPv4 and domain name restrictions, which allow us to grant or deny access to our web server based upon the IP address or domain that the incoming connection is coming from. So we'll go back to our default website and we'll scroll down and we'll click on IPv4 address and domain name restrictions. We'll double click on that. And in our actions menu, we can select either an allow entry or a deny one. And both of these are exactly the same. So I'm not going to look at both of them. The only difference, of course, is that one is going to allow people to access our site. And the other, of course, is going to deny them access. So since the default is to allow access, let's click on add deny entry. And we can enter in either a specific domain an IP address, or a range of IP addresses. So let's say that you have a specific IP address in mind. You can enter it in here. So let's say 10.32.0.100, and then we'll click on OK. And this IP address now won't be able to access our website. Now I did say that the default is to allow everyone to access our website, but we just denied a single IP address from accessing it. But if you want to configure your website the other way around and deny everyone, but then add in a specific IP address to allow access to, we'll click on Edit Feature Settings, and we'll change this drop-down box from the default of Allow to Deny. And now, no one will have access to our site unless we explicitly define an Allow entry. In this video, we've talked about IIS website security. We've discussed removing any unused IIS components, since if you're not using them, removing them will also remove those potential areas for attack. We've discussed creating unique bindings for each of your websites, moving the default root directories to another disk, and configuring permissions to allow or grant users access to your web content. We also talked about implementing SSL and URL authorization. And then we finished with a discussion about using IP address and domain name restrictions to grant or deny access based upon the IP address or domain name. Security is an important aspect of any computer nowadays, and if you're administering or designing public-facing computers like web servers, you need to be especially vigilant in ensuring that you're presenting a server that's as secure as possible. We hope you've enjoyed this video, and would like to thank you for supporting Winstructor.